Okay. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. I'm a bit nasally, so hopefully I can get through this smoothly. <clears throat> the title is A Geometrical Acknowledgement of the Inner Realms. And so why does a human being yeah, on earth require to speak about geometry that is present behind our eyes? You see, life for every human being I find is becoming a unique uh, hierarchical value system. As human beings identify with a certain form and they go through various life formats, you know, various moments, value systems eventually rise and it's kind of like the identifying uh, the values that a human being uses to identify themselves they kind of appear to me at least as like cities cities of various moments in, in this space kind uh, space-time continuum where the human being has experienced different relationships and then these relationships echo <clears throat> they echo on to the next day and what that means is I have in some sense many pretty much these couple of years that I've been giving these talks, every day I wake up and I come to speak. And the moment I speak, it's as if I enter an office of familiarity with inner imagery. I feel... <clears throat> The human being requires to come up to, with two, two strategies to life. Now, first of all, uh, how can we come, with a, come up with a strategy for a system that has unknown factors? That's one question. Another factor is why? Why do we need to have a plan or a sort of direction in the void? You know, this was a big question. Uh, the child is conditioned to think, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do? Where is everything going to head to? And eventually you see that every person's life is heading towards their end. So when you kind of realize your life is, uh, we are all mortal, that's kind of a privilege of the Homo sapien. Compared to other species, we know of our mortality. Now that bums us out, that causes us a certain range of suffering, the fact that it's suddenly going to stop. But... At the same time, it gives us an opportunity to respond. And oftentimes, when I look at my conscious waking state, it is not per se just the state to articulate or try to um, understand something. It is sometimes a state of action. And what that means is it's like there's certain states of mind where you are like an explorer. You got to go see it for yourself. You got to see what it is, you know, and then function. But there's some states. <clears throat> where I, I would say regardless of how much you comprehend that moment or system or event or whatever, it is in some sense an action-oriented display. That means I kind of get a feeling. The days that I feel I'm going to be physically working, it's going to, those days have a different sensitivity even from the beginning of the day. And it's, there's something in, um, that was in the movie Gladiator that was fascinating. It's, I think it's a deleted scene. <clears throat> There is a scene <clears throat> where the gladi uh, Maximus from the movie Gladiator, he hasn't been taken up to the Colosseum yet. And he is kind of underneath the Colosseum and the Emperor wants to fight him pretty much. And so before he leaves, his general buddy that betrayed him at the beginning of the movie comes up to him and says, Maximus, uh, I can get you out of here. You know, your soldiers are coming as if at the end of the day he, he still held true loyalty. And so when he tells Maximus that should I get you out, Maximus is smiling and he says, nature never puts one in something that nature kind of hasn't prepared them for. 
And that was a remarkable statement that all living beings, all creatures of nature have an ally they're forgetting. It is the overall rhythmic abidance with their ecosystem. You know, just because we are in some sense, we are an advanced, um, <clears throat> you can say sophisticated animal <clears throat> wearing suits and ties, it doesn't mean we have forgotten nature. It doesn't mean we can ever forget nature. It just means that our heart heartbeat is the reminder of the silent songs of our world. That there are many ways intelligent mo intelligence moves and is moving prior to interpretation or definition. And if you look at yourself, what is this life you're living? You are kind of watching your life as a movie. I'm pretty sure every person's life or their mind appears as a witness of the events where they go through. Do you know? So it's as if you are like a director of your own life. You're watching as, the, as a sort of space for your physical manifest activity. <clears throat> You know, <clears throat> there is something with geometry. There is something that strangely, since the beginning, I was pulled to it. And I used to, how can I tell you, like, I, when I was a kid, I didn't draw. I only started drawing after 2015. And it only happened because I found a way to approach the world as if I didn't know it beforehand. And I can tell you that was the a sort of blessing. You see, most people think knowledge is a blessing, you know. <clears throat> I mean, Thanos, <laughs> Thanos and Tony Stark probably think it's a curse. But let me tell you, the thing with knowledge is that you are in a system, you find yourself in a system, and you have sensory perception. What does that mean? That means your sight is a translation of a value of whatever is here. <clears throat> so it's kind of like there's a reason why in India they would say your parents are your first god. Do you know they would say that? It was a saying. And when you think about it, what does that mean my parents are the first god? It means that there are many moments in this life that one's intelligence alone cannot authorize the, the greater evolution of. Do you know? That means there are some things that regardless of how much we explain, regardless of how much we put it into a narrative or box it up into a story, it is an incident that energetically is taking place. And energy is not cruel, but it can be blind to the preferences of man. That means... <clears throat> When we kind of look at life, you owe the universe your existence. But the universe doesn't owe you its existence. Do you see? <clears throat> you are here once in this grand mansion of the cosmos. I want to share certain moments where geometry has found me. <clears throat> in 2000, in 2013, 12, 13, something like that. I had a dream, guys, and for all those who've been following these talks for a while, this is like one of the most personal things I can say, one of the most transformative things that have happened to me in this life. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you every detail of it, because these kind of talks are at the same time a journal for my future self. So,
I had a dream. Um, in the dream, I find myself in a sleep paralysis in my in, on my, in my bed um, in the morning. So what is it? It's like I think it's like 4 a.m. No, it wasn't 4 a.m. I think it was like close to 6 a.m. I suddenly find myself, my body is asleep, but my mind has, as if it has awakened early, as if that chemical that kind of your body produces, so when you run in your dreams, you don't actually run in the bed. It was as if that chemical had lingered around and my mind had awoken up earlier than my body. What that means is you can move your mind easily, but you can't move your body easily. And the way for anybody who has sleep paralysis is that the, the way you get out of it is you actually stop exerting physical force and you just pay attention to your breath. You know, people don't realize how valuable, how many secrets of this cosmos are just in conscious breathing. If you become conscious of your breath, it will give you access to hidden libraries. <clears throat> so in this dream, I have the sleep paralysis. I find myself kind of awake in the bed. Body is asleep. I'm witnessing the body. I, I can see my eyes are closed. And in that moment, what happens is that uh, I, get a, I hear a word. For the first time in my life, I heard a word in my dream. And the word, the moment I heard it, I not only knew the spelling, the instant spelling, I didn't even know the meaning, but I had the certainty of the word. And the instant I hear the word, the word was Lida, L-I space D-A-H. Still one of those mysteries of my life trying to figure out. I have certain uh, impressions of what it could be, but still it's a mystery. And so I remember I say this word. Imagine I hear a word in my dream. I say it. And when I say this word, there is a sort of instant projection. Not a projection like, like a cannonball projection, but just an instant flash. And I see myself in some sense in, at the end of that instant coming down from my ceiling. And my ceiling was cubic and wave-like, you know? I don't know how to explain it. But anyways, in the, if now in that instant, I see images. And an image I see is a giant triangular cave on a giant rock in space. That's, how, what, that's, the, inner, uh, that's the imagery that comes in that instant. And I also see another image of a sort of creature <clears throat> in a, um, what do you call it? Like on some chair. <laughs> Now that part, I don't need to get too much into details of, but I'll tell you this, that in the dream there was a restriction. I was hovering in front of this giant inverted triangular cave on this giant rock wall in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of space, and in that instant, uh, instant I knew there was a restriction. Kid, have you ever felt a restriction in a dream? Something you see in a dream and it gives you an emotional uncertainty. It was an intense moment of emotional uncertainty on one level, but it was on another weird level a certainty. Now, That dream was, believe it or not, a, another way where my unconscious mind gifted me with symbolism. Dreams are rare because for them to even happen is rare. You know, sometimes in life, a strange, <clears throat> a strange solitude finds you. I think for most people it may happen. Where silence and solitude finds you, 
and in this silence, the speed of the world is no longer of concern. Similar to how Mahatma Gandhi says there's more to life than increasing its speed, most human beings, they have an archetypal relationship, they function through an egoic vehicle, and in some sense this egoic vehicle, in some sense, is they are obsessed to, with its outcome. Do you know, it's, it's kind of like we are tearing up the earth with our minds into different earths, and then we're just searching the result of that. There has to be at least 10% of the human life dedicated to the advancement of their civilization. It has to be like this for all species. That means it's like you're not an individual just to experience individual moments. Now, what does a collective moment mean? What does the banner that your civilization carries mean? What does nationalism mean? You know, what does language mean in the void? So these are deep questions, and these deep questions eventually will take us to reevaluate the geometry of our axioms, or how we have put life in an on an axis. You know what that means? That means good and bad is an axis. Morality is an axis of perception. That means you need two reference points to exist as a moral creature. You need to have a reference for what is right and what is wrong. A life beyond design is the designer. Really, if you think about all creatures, on all human beings, as, as having an inventive spirit, what does that mean? That means they appear in a place, and then they look around the place, and they use what is in the place, in their environment, to build. Now, this concept of building is so important in philosophy because when it comes to truth, people on this planet have been searching for something. All your ancestors, I am telling you, you cannot exist in a world so huge and not wonder about the unknown. And the issue is we are conditioned to reject the unknown. We are conditioned to be afraid of results of different decisions. I can tell you, you don't know how much of my life I had a sort of uh, kind of, it's as if in my youth I was raised around compassionate religious people, Do you know, like, like my grandmother, grandfather, you know, both sides of the family. When I was young, I would spend time with them and you would see like this kind of, you know, very nice Persian grandmother kind of with her rosary beads praying do you know it was uh, I've had like in my childhood me and my brother were playing with Legos and my grandmother <laughs> bless her like a shaman like a, like a Native American shaman came and I, 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 I don't know what the seed is called beetroot or something like she would she would kind of you do this shamanic thing where me and my brother would ask her why are you doing this and she would be like to, to have evil spirits be, be away you know, and it was, it was there's something unique, guys. It, religion gave people an author, a very narrow authorization for their imagination. As if, if you look at really the religious approach, it is saying only in this lens there is validity. Now, if you think that every lens is valid, then truth becomes kind of accessible by everything. Do you know? <clears throat> that means... I had this impression of decency through the ideological system, but when I came and saw the history of the world, I saw indecency. And so then there comes a choice in the mind of the creature. The creature chooses the way it looks at its world. Is it a battlefield? Is it a playground? Is it hell? Is it heaven? Or was it always on the earth? So this notion of finding truth and this notion of building truth are two different states of mind. And I will tell you, after you have found the greatest truth, you will build the greatest. That's the nature of life. You cannot be exposed to someone doing a backflip and not having a part of you want to do that if you can. Do you know? 
like there's many things that call to us throughout the day. <clears throat> it's not just people that call to you. You know, it's not just people that when they speak, they, our attention goes to their communication. It is also a phenomenal change when things change, when phenomena changes. And you know, I've experienced kind of climbing trees in spring and also staring at empty kind of branches in fall. <clears throat> and I can tell you that both are valid states. That means I kind of thought about morality. Uh, I thought about the superhero and the villain that I had seen in so many animations in my childhood. And you know what it is? We choose in every moment whether we walk with the world or we don't walk with the world. And I am telling you the mass solution to a confidence that ushers in an advanced civilization is finding a moment that you can trust. And when you trust it, believe it or not, you find truth. But after you find truth, you come into the creative space. You know, I was having a <clears throat> very interesting conversation with a Sony Muslim friend of mine. And his name was Muhammad, and I was talking, we were talking about the purpose of design. And of course, in philosophy, there is this incredible statement where it's, it's the cosmological argument. It is pretty much an argument that takes authorization over the mystery by design. So that means we've had people look at this cosmos and they're like, where did all this stuff come from? <laughs> you know, and not where, not the energetic output only, where did the specific, why is it that in nature, you look at like trees and you don't see a symmetry? But you look at the human body and you see a symmetry. What is that symmetry? Why did, if there is a God, why did God like spheres? Why did God like spheres so much? You know? <laughs> and so really, <clears throat> I was looking into this notion that uh, when you look at what is designed, I mean, we've, we have access mainly. Uh, nowadays, we're more occupied with human design than natural design. What does that mean? That means like when you look at the purpose of a cup of orange juice, a glass of orange juice, you see the purpose of the glass is to be the container. And the purpose of the orange juice is to be poured in a container. Do you know? And so what does that mean? That means the design of the cup, if you were an alien, if you were a creature that didn't have access to human archetypes, you would not understand why we need a cup. Do you know? You would not understand the, the purpose and the design of the cup if you didn't design it. <clears throat> and so human beings felt in the 6th century that they had opened their eyes in a designed world where the design, the first, the cause of the design was unknown. Now when we enter the secular society, we find that they, they are bringing up a very valid point that it was in some sense nothing first. There was nothing here, then something came here. You know, or that nothing was just quantum fluctuation and then it just moved. You know, so, so human beings are constantly in dispute of what came first. And Mr. Within is saying this cause and effect mentality is efficient and advantageous in certain dimensions, but in certain dimensions it can never be. Certain dimensions, the cause and effect are simultaneous. The cause has not ended. The cause has not transformed into an effect. The cause dimension remains and the effect dimensions arise. That means just because you do something as a human being doesn't mean you have forgotten who you were. Just because the rug gets pulled from underneath your feet doesn't mean you can't stand anymore. You just have to jump when the rug's being pulled. <clears throat> and enter a new domain of thought. So welcome everyone to the chat section. I, I tend to 
um, navigate to the chat. Like I look at the chat section and then I give the talk and then I look at the chat section. Um, so uh, feel free to engage the chat section, everyone. This is an open episode. I am alive once today. <laughs> So you see, guys, there's there's something. For me, geometry is divine. And I will say it very boldly. And some people will be like, what does that mean, Mr. Within? You know, you look at a sphere and you look at a circle and think it's divine. <laughs> and I'll be like, yeah, yeah. There's nothing more divine than a circle. It is the perfect, believe it or not, the circle in Zen is the full cycle of enlightenment most people feel that they are, they they are in some it's like this i remember seeing this um i don't know who drew it but whoever drew it bless the guy there was this kind of cartoon like magazine you know those cartoons you uh, not cartoons those um <clears throat> kind of poster like th those comic bits you sometimes find in like magazines i remember this was a facebook meme <clears throat> and it was a Facebook picture and it showed this guy where it was like this bald guy with glasses and he was a working man like you'd think he's an accountant and it said you know Bob went on a journey to find his real self <laughs> you know and in the next picture it shows Bob has he, he dropped he's he's gotten rid of his uh, gray, um, gray suit and his glasses and his briefcase, his accountant briefcase. And the next picture you see, he's on the top of a mountain with a giant beard and simple clothing as if he's, he's one of those people who suddenly uh, felt, um, they felt invalidated by their culture experientially. So they, they found validation for their experience in another culture. So, <clears throat> so this person suddenly went hyper spiritual, you know? And <laughs> the next scene, it shows he's got into the mountain, and on top of the mountain, it says, it was then that Bob found his real self. And it shows in the mountain, there isn't a yogi. There isn't a mystic meditating. In the mountain, there is himself waiting for him, standing with a briefcase and a suit. So this dude left his environment to go and become something else only to realize that the natural position of his being wasn't a mistake. <clears throat> there is something about the intellect that too much pursuit of it may make you feel you're deviating from the natural growth among the environment. I mean, that's natural. You can't be a scholar without feeling a nostalgia for a hidden realm, really. Uh, that means you can't you, you can't care for knowledge if you don't see the unknown or if you can't be content with the unknown You know what that means this whole belief system game this whole thing that I'm saying that our species ever since idol worship Think about it back in the day people worship objects somebody saw an apple. It's like yo, this is God man You know and his friend came and ate the apple and he's like did you just eat my God? <laughs> So that was the era of idol worship, okay? But then we moved on. What did we start as a human being obsessively putting our attention on after objects, subjects, language worship? Suddenly all around the world there came revelations. There came the enforcement of language as a, as a, as a sort of first attempt of the world giving some instruction to the imagination. As if, all right, human being, your, you, your eyes have opened on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Now, where else can this nowhere go? And you know what happened? We looked at nowhere and we turned it to now here with a little space in between. I feel we are the space between our inner and outer realm as the witness. Experience is space-like, it is field-like, existence is particle, uh, object-like. Your subjects are rhythms, they are rivers. Your objective being is, 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 is something that without being put into motion is already something. You see a lot of subjects, if I don't make a sound, uh, the concept just exists in my inner realms. But when I come and sit down at the table and I'm like, all right, let's talk. So in that moment, it, it's like the, the when I say the concept, something from the inner realm managed to endure into the outer. 
So what, what I kind of see in another way, playfully, how these talks are coming across from my viewpoint to myself when I share them, it seems like as if I'm releasing, literally opening up the gates of my inner realms to the outer. Because I have concluded as a human being that there is no greater game to play than to open the eyes of the world towards an advanced civilization. It's not, I, am, I don't uh, w walk in the same halls as the school of thought of certain ancient traditions. You see, back in the day, you imagine there were no teachers, there were no schools, there were no sciences. Pretty much there was a dude in a village who knew something. You know, and so that became the guru concept. Okay, <clears throat> and in Indian culture, there's a lot of that. In Indian culture, God is not seen, is seen to be found in every moment. Do you know? It's another way of saying if, if God is everything and within everything, it's kind of like God is every word ever said. Do you know what I mean? It's very hard to take a collective symbol and not apply, not see its validity in individual realms. <clears throat> and if you think about it, really in a very cool way, in India, we hear that man is God. You know, everything is God. In, in of course, a certain monotheistic traditions, everything is God's. It, everything belongs to God in, in, for example, Christianity, Islam, Judaism. But in, in for example, uh, more polytheistically inclined visions, uh, it's as if God is everything. You can't, God's face is not just in the face of a color. You see, God is, 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 is strangely a concept that never can be a concept. It is the creator of the concept. Right, so, so in some sense, many people have an unknown relationship with their own source. And this source is too far to reverse engineer back. You know what that means? That means the child can't remember when the doctor slapped it on its back. But the child can remember when it wanted to buy a toy. Or when it wanted to play with a toy. So you see, it's, it's as if after a certain point, there isn't enough image to back up the ex explanations of experiential, of subtler, of subjective phenomena. And uh, I hope this is not on mute, guys. Is, it, is everyone hearing me? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> In other words, we our source is unknown, and believe it or not, our effect is You know, it's, um, I think, if the world is alive, and you have experienced life's freedom, you will be okay with the unknown. If you haven't experienced life's freedom, you have to contain stuff in knowledge. That means I could totally understand that the scientific mind is doing something so noble, so incredible, that it doesn't want to take uh, spontaneous leaps into subjective realism. Now, what does that mean? That means there are some hunter-gatherers that go to their inner realms and they won't explore if they can't bring anything back to the tribe. And there are some hunter-gatherers of the inner realms that they just want to see what is out there. You see, it's as if there is one person who even, I think you can find this in speech. I've personally, there's been times where I've spoken where I have not been the major audience. Do you know what that means? That means I think the best way to speak anywhere is to imagine yourself in the audience and how you would react to what you say. <laughs> Do you know? And 
That means every time I speak, I hear my own voice as well, as much as I communicate it. You cannot speak without hearing your voice, and it's the same idea as you cannot fight without hurting yourself. Fighting is a, is a pastime, is a human pastime, but is right now uh, our intelligence is more exciting than warfare. Warfare is a narrow application of intelligence, but what the intelligence can do. Guys, like I think people are taking lightly what I'm saying about Civilization 2.0, uh, this idea I've created a sort of blueprint. I, I pretty much designed it like an architect drawing the model, now the future generations have to build it. Because I've predicted that in, in the year 2622, if the civilization, if the civilization goes through a set of great transformations, as I've called them, and <clears throat> finds its core values, its natural values, in 2600, I, I have envisioned that humanity should lift all human civilization and infrastructure into the sky. The moment we live in our orbit, for the first time, Earth has not been a boxed up resource station. That means right now it makes no sense, guys. Nationalism is, is remarkable in how much it has progressed history, but it is unremarkable when it comes to resource allocation. Because if you think about it, <clears throat> the earth is a buffet. Now, some people are going to be like, what do you mean, Mr. Within, it's a buffet? You know, are you calling earth Mandarin? <laughs> and I'll, I'll be like this, guys. No, it, it, it's this mentality that because we are occupying two-dimensional space and because we are creating borders and walls, we are limiting the resources of the earth to land ownership but if we were living in sky cities in our orbit which is phase one of civilization 2.0 we would suddenly realize imagine you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet and you suddenly see another customer in the establishment has gone to two of the foods and they've put both of their hands and body over the foods and you've gone to get the food and from like that specific dish in the buffet and suddenly that person's like no man you need to have a citizenship to access this food you know you need to have this verification this verification and i was like if human beings sometimes guys it makes sense to give the human being like you can totally see yourself as an employer of a business and see an employee that can that deserves more work you know <clears throat> that means you can definitely give people's uh heavier weight and you can give them lighter weight. And the decency of even parent, uh, um, parental guidance is, should be this, how much weight is being given to the minds of the future. Because think about it, guys. Imagine a child is born, and from the beginning of its life, it experiences cruelty, 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 cruelty. That child is going to be like, all right, this place stinks. Why should I care? And that is the failure of civilization, that moment. You know, civilization has not failed just because you suffer. Civilization fails when you don't do anything about the suffering. That means that moment where that person didn't try harder, all their ancestors were like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> all the spirits of their ancestors were like, is this kid serious? We all endured through wars and... Uh, you know, terrifying, savage survival conditions so that this person, this, you know, you don't try a little harder. Do you know how hard your ancestors tried for you to be able to go to a Starbucks and order a coffee? <laughs> Do you know how, how many wars were fought so we can experience free Wi-Fi at coffee shops? <laughs> <laughs> oh man <clears throat> on the most simplest in the most simplest way of looking at life it's just design that's occurring 
and then this design, we attribute subtler design upon it, which is language. So right now, what I am doing as a creature is like there's just this dimension of just existential dimension. Things are existing regardless of my free will. Regardless if I do something or not, the planet is orbiting around the sun. Do you see? So on some level, the fascinating thing about existence is that it's given design. Sometimes <clears throat> gratefulness, the mind is so advanced, the same way you can see endless sorrow, you can see endless joy. It's all about just navigating your attention. That means whoever you think you are as a being, your attention can change literally. And you can totally be a different being. And that's been the case, really. So an existential dimension where it's just static design and the experiential dimension is the dynamism of the static design. It's like the atoms are the alphabet and the living of life as a creature is the speech, is, is using those letters to in some sense create worlds <clears throat> you know it's it's a very interest interesting kind of approach i think that we try to reverse engineer how subjects came about to get a comprehension of how objectivity could have been generated from higher dimensions that means really we're all moments of sight and moments of sensory data and it is our movement our free will, uh, our direction in life that really gives meaning. So I can tell you that the purpose of life uh, is the position you're looking at. That means people's self-worth is not the past. You know, if I right now imagine I am who I was yesterday, do you know how ignorant that would be to who I am now? Do you know? It's like it would be as ignorant as an old person, a person of age, feeling as if like they're young, so they carry a heavy weight and their back hurts. You see, life, of course, must be an effort. I've realized this more <clears throat> valuable than intellectual precision is the emotional stability. Because if the emotions are unstable, uh, it's like suddenly hell popped out, popped out of the corner of the world, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and what I mean by that is the way you walk, the way your breath is meaningful to you, the way novelty finds your eyes like, a, like the light of a new day. The villain was a saint. Because if the villain didn't exist, the superhero would never know how much able it was. And if the challenges in your life didn't exist, you would not know how able you are to answer them. And I think the civilization has been in this uh, linguistic simulation. Literally, I want you to imagine uh, you suddenly... Uh, uh, you were walking in the park and suddenly the world transformed and you realize you're standing in, uh, in a garden on Saturn or on a garden in Jupiter. Imagine right now Earth is a simu digital simulation in, uh, on one of the moons of Jupiter where we're living as a totally different civilization. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I want to <clears throat> say something that is um, I haven't said before. <laughs> you know, and and that's really this this idea that the matter defines the body. That means I've had so many moments where I've touched the cup and then I've touched my left hand and I'm like, what's the difference? <laughs> And the difference is really what moves in the field of awareness. This is the most crucial thing, guys. Enjoy how you're not just the self throughout the day. Enjoy the awareness that this self uh, provides an access to. Awareness is an appreciation of your mind. The mind is not a physical idea. It's not an object. And it can have as many subjects you want to connect to it. You know? <clears throat> I feel language is sandwiched between the known and the unknown. So if you have an unknown intent with language, the expression can be endless. If you have a known intent, you can set the limit whenever. Most of life appears to be <clears throat> just the relationship of space and matter. And we are an intelligent relationship of space and matter. And an intelligence that defines its intelligence. Like, you can't get next le more next level than that, really. <laughs> it's like, what are you? I'm an intelligence that defines its intelligence. You know? Bodhiharma, the uh, fifth patriarch of Buddhism in Japan. Uh, so he pretty much took Buddhism to Japan, Bodhiharma, if I remember correctly. And <clears throat> Bodhiharma has this story where if this was a movie, you'd see Bodhiharma entering the halls of, what do you call it? The halls of the king a king's throne and Bodhiharma this intense he's one of the coolest figures in history I find you know like on, on, like there's some I'll tell you some people who I feel were the most badass uh, had them were the most badass kind of uh, philosoph philosophically open-minded people I would say the list would go Diogenes, Bodhiharma, uh, Attar these three, for now, come to my mind to be on the same badass level. <laughs> their, their, their vision was badass. What that means is they saw. They didn't have a fear of their inner realms. They looked far into their inner realms. Bodhiharma enters the throne room. The king is standing, sitting in his throne and his councilman is beside him and the throne is filled. And the king in front of everybody in the throne room says Bodhiharma. And Bodhiharma's just silently there, this sort of man with a very chaotic certainty. Bodhiharma is there. The king says, Bodhiharma, welcome to my empire. You know how many he, he tells, he starts listing a number of all the temples he built, Buddhist temples, all the Buddhist texts he spread out. He pretty much, pretty much before Bodhiharma came to J Japan, the king spread a lot of Buddhism everywhere. Bodhiharma comes and the king looks at Bodhiharma in front of his whole throne room and says, Bodhiharma, tell me now, what's the merit? What did I get out of it? Tell me. I made uh, so many Buddhist statues and temples and I disseminated teachings. It, it's like, tell me what, what's in it for me. <laughs> <clears throat> and Bodhiharma looks at an emperor and scolds an emperor pretty much. That's why I'm telling you he's badass. He scolds an emperor and he says, all you have done is foolishness. He's saying this to the most powerful man in the realm, to the king, okay? 
and the king is shocked and everybody in the throne room is quiet and Bodhiharma storms out of the throne room and he goes outside of the palace wall and starts meditating his face, his forehead inches away from the wall of the palace. Can you imagine that? So imagine shouting, scolding a king and then going and meditating. And the reason Bodhiharma was doing that is because he was in a deep state of renunciation. He was renunciating, he was purely... We can say the inner realms were more tangible back in the day. You could exist in your inner realms easier. Now the speed of the inner realms changing has reached such heights that you can't really exist in your inner realms until you're in a place of complete silence and stillness. That's why those people who go to nature, they get access to the rhythm of their own mind. But those people in, in, this, in cities and civilization, we are getting influenced by civilization's mind. And we have chosen that. We have chosen to live uh, <clears throat> in the city. It's, it's a conscious choice. That means anybody who is, who is uncertain of living in the city shouldn't live in the city. I'm telling you, it's much more liberating to live in nature. Because there is a silence and solitude and there is a return back into the decency of your inner realms. But so society, the whole point of civilization is that it's the Rubik's Cube we're trying to solve as 8 billion creatures. It's something that we're, uh, we are very joyfully accepting the challenge because there's no greater game to play on a rock in the middle of nowhere. And it is rare for civilizations to occur. What that means is a candlelight was lit after 4 billion years. Like it took four billion years for the spark of our consciousness to be this calibrated and sophisticated. Now this, we must take advantage of this. Bodhiharma, when he scolds the king, the king is like, what the fuck? <laughs> and Bodhiharma, as he leaves, the councilman looks at the king to make sure the king, the councilman of the king was a wise guy, like a wise person. And the councilman of the king tells the king, listen, you don't have to, the king is getting angry to a level where he might hurt Bodhiharma. And then the councilman of the king tells the king, listen, the reason Bodhiharma said it didn't have merit was not because what you did didn't have merit. The, the councilman like, uh, of the king is telling the king that what you did was great. You, you spreading... Uh, you making people be able to handle their inner realms was great, telling the guy who was spreading the king. But w the way you ask Bodhiharma is there me merit, like as if your mouth is watering for heaven? Like that's that's not nice, you know? So Bodhiharma scolded you because you, you pretty much, like a hungry hound, asked him for the merit of uh, austerity. So the king suddenly realizes that his attitude was the problem, not what he actually did. His behavior that he showed the world was the problem. Anyways, Bodhiharma is in his meditation. After many nights, one foggy night, <clears throat> Bodhiharma is of course in a samadhi. He's pretty much, he's not moving. He's a pre samadhi is another way of saying you're living in another dimension of being. <clears throat> so, um, some guy, some guy who, believe it or not, at the end of this story, he ends up being the sixth patriarch of Buddhism. But this person uh, comes to Bodhiharma, he hears Bodhiharma is in town, he comes to Bodhiharma and says, Bodhiharma, uh, actually, sorry, how the story goes is Bodhi, he comes to Bodhiharma, says, I have a problem, help me, kind of in a desperate situation. The guy has this kind of very, he's suffering from some inner issue <clears throat> and Bodhiharma doesn't acknowledge him and the story is a bit savage guys he this man as, as I was reading this in the Zen book he cuts his hand like that's some next level stuff you know that means your problem is so non-physical that you don't care about the physical anymore <clears throat> so what happens is that this dude cuts his hand and he looks at Bodhiharma as a sign of loyalty. I don't know how that was a sign of loyalty. That was a messed up sign of loyalty. But anyways, in the story, that was a sign of loyalty. He cuts his hand and he looks at Bodhiharma as if the reason I think he cut his hand is as if Bodhiharma has no choice then to answer him. I don't know. I don't know. It's a messed up. Like that part's a bit messed up. But anyways, the, guy's, the guy cuts his hand. He looks at Bodhiharma in strangely hand in hand and says, Bodhiharma. 
My mind is restless. I haven't slept. I am dying. Help me. And Bodhiharma, he steps out of his samadhi and grants this man an audience. And he says, what is it? <laughs> He's like, what the fuck? What's wrong with your hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry what happened what happens is that bodhiharma says what is it and the guy says an important statement he says bodhiharma my mind is restless please pacify my mind please pacify <clears throat> Just a second, folks. <coughs> Body armor looks at the man and with an intense stare says, okay, I'll pacify your mind, this restless mind you speak of. And Bodhiharma says, but before I pacify your mind, bring your mind and put it in front of me. Like a cup on a table, put your mind in front of me and I'll pacify the source of your problem. And the guy for the first time is asked the question he has never considered before. He's like, wait a minute. You want me to bring my mind in front of you? He's like, and Bodhiharma is pretty much telling him, find your mind and bring it in front of me. And the guy looks and he looks and he suddenly gets shocked. He hits a moment of existential experiential shock. And he looks at Bodhiharma and he says, I can't find my mind. I can't find it. I can't bring it to you. I can't find it. And Bodhiharma, just like, uh, believe it or not, like, a pilot doing a smooth landing of an airplane looks at him and says, there, your mind is pacified. And there is a sudden silence. And it tends to be the case that sudden silence breeds sudden enlightenment. The man in the story attains nirvana. He suddenly stops. The storms behind his eyes stop. The sky becomes clear. The diamond vision is attained. As the diamond sutras say, keep your mind alive and free without abiding in anywhere or anything. That means we tend to, we are conditioned as creatures to think of ourselves as this object. But I am telling you, <clears throat> we are like, as the Yoga Patanjali Sutra so brilliantly said, we are like a glass orb moving through many colored surfaces. And my awareness in this moment, in this moment I'm sitting on my porch right now, this moment is the color if my mind is a glass orb speaking to you. All these trees I see outside, the blue sky with the white glow, Language has not evolved this far <clears throat> for our inner realms to just remain quiet, guys. I feel it is uh, the purpose of human design to aim towards the advanced. For me, the word advanced is the most beautiful wo word. There is no greater word in this, on this planet, on the, in this world of ours, that I appreciate more. It is even, it is the most divinest thing. Because any idea of divine divinity is novel movement. Anything you look in history that human beings couldn't explain exactly, they explained at least to themselves through a certain story. They said it was the miracles 
of angels that you know some people said they you know it's it's fascinating it's as if like we have a conscious mind but then there is the doubt of the conscious mind which is the subconscious existence <clears throat> and the more you doubt the more the conscious and unconscious are veiled the more you trust life the more your conscious mind has an access to your unconscious so you might not believe but I find the test of true intelligence is trust a pilot, its in, its greatest intelligence is trusting the moment, because what else can you do? Do we just linger as sight until the candle melts, or do we utilize this biological evolution? And I feel a lot of human life is being wasted over uh, inner imagination, and you know what that means? That means, no, sorry, not inner imagination. A lot of life is just being kept as potential in the inner realms and not manifesting. <clears throat> You know, I chose this wallpaper to show you that nature indirectly gives you access to perfection. That's the brilliance of nature. You see, there are no straight lines in nature, but what becomes straight is, for example, <clears throat> you know how I thought in ancient times that people's minds saw straight lines aside from drawing them or building them? When I say a straight line in nature, that means something nature produced that was a straight line. <coughs> That's why School of Athens geometry was seen as divine. Because in nature, you don't see straight lines. You see uh, entanglements. So when we look at, I think even on a quantum scale, we're even f finding ourselves getting entangled. The simultaneity of the electron in various states. The grand mysteries that science has touched but has not yet dared to enter. The greatest advancement of science is to uh, metaphorically enter the black hole. To allow what updates knowledge to be advancements in the unknown. <clears throat> Human beings throughout history have experienced rebellion. They have experienced revolution. They have experienced the impact of their own creations and they have experienced the impact of nature. We have been pushed around and bullied by the laws of the universe and we have at the same time bullied ourselves by our own laws. And so reality is progressing further and now it's called, it's 2020. You know, and life appears as a sort of civilization, and that is a huge achievement to even have a checkpoint in the void. You know, so I am I am very grateful for the efforts of history, but now the future generations must release their inner might. And what that means is you're going to see, and all scholars, every living human being that cares for knowledge, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to suddenly open your eyes, and the playgrounds of your childhood will become subjective battlefields. And you will see that man has not just been living alongside man. Man has been living among ideology. And so the same way we walk in the streets of humanity, thoughts walk in the streets of our minds. And there is a massive programming, a massive system based on various programs. When you go into one culture as if, wow, they have a different program, they behave in a certain way. When you go to another culture, they behave in a certain way. But when you think about the future of the future of the future, future to the power of the future, you know, you see that it is in, in, it is the inconceivable. It is the introduction of the in, inconceivable. It is the grandest rebellion. It is the final push of nature, of man's mind. It is the ultimate liftoff of evolution.
towards the inconceivable. And we have to stop being language worshippers because when you worship language, that language chains you. You become a chained titan when you have a belief system. And you see, a titan was something that tested the God's power. Do you know what that means? That means there was a moment that could reach an ultimate moment. It was as if the creation of the Creator attempted to become the Creator. And it was as if the war of man and gods began, you know, and there was the, in some sense, even you can say the Titans in Greek mythology fighting the gods is another way of saying in, in ancient Vedic culture, you had the Asuras fighting the Devas, do you know, and it was as if a dimension, uh, it was, it's like there was a multi, there was, do you believe it? In ancient books, there is a multi-dimensional war going on. And I am telling you, Earth is the bunker. The battlefield is still running. Many forces are fighting for containment of value. And the, it's like pretty much, let me tell you, the more Earth becomes like a gladiator arena, the more extinction lingers closer. Extinction is going to come and pretty much destroy everyone on the battlefield. You know? When we look at history we see sacrifice but before the sacrifice there was a potential for both realms I, in my writings, I had come up with this idea. And guys, I'm going to get to geometry very soon. You know, just going with the rhythm. Um, in my writings, I'd written something, <clears throat> a very unique idea. And it was the idea that because if human life is simply directed at only the self, if you are a self obsessed creature, and what does that mean? That means you are only seeing your inner realms. You have not cared for the outer realm. Do you know? That means it's as if when you look at life, you are the center of your gravity. You know, the idea of you. But I'm telling you, there, there, uh, that is not the highest state of mind. The highest state of mind is when actually the center of the universe becomes the center of your being. It is a journey back into the inner earth. I wrote about this idea called the great work and every human being has to put at least has to attempt at least try to in some sense see a value like a business in a short term and a long term to their existence okay the short term value that's self gratification and that's okay that's healthy the long term value can't be self gratification because the self is temporary after a hundred years max it's like you're out of here the, the human being has to <clears throat> take a different train. So, <laughs> <clears throat> the being has to take a different train. But it, it, so I'm saying that the great work is a suggestion of how much you attempted the ultimate win win resolution of self and world. How much you. Let me tell you, if you right now think you're a, you, you see yourself as good and you see your world as bad, you know what that means? Technically, you're, you're lying to yourself. Because the only way you can be good if, if, if your world is good. Did you know? <clears throat> and what I mean by that, every person who's been decent and has had a morality, they had an inner realm where they were trusting to be good, at least. And evolution beyond the limits of a system. That is human glory. And I'm telling you, the scholars, uh, that somebody said this, he said there's two worlds the person is existing in. <clears throat> and this isn't even to 
metaphysical. It's just this idea that there's a world that was here before you were born, and there's a world here that will be here here after you're born. Most people, most children on this earth don't care. They don't care about the world that was here before them, and they don't care about the world that will, that will be here after them. They care about the dash between the tombstone. Do you know? So that dash in life from so one world is the moment your consciousness emerged, and then you can say the world, the other world is how the world emerged before your consciousness. Humanity has to play a new song. That's the ethos. That's the new collective ethos that uh, scholars, even such as Jordan Peterson, <coughs> have looked into. That stories are no longer. Uh, how can you tell? How can I say it? We are evolving beyond the stories we tell ourselves into a recognition that the storyteller is the rhythm of a field. And there's mysteries in this life that are, they surpass uh, what you find at first. So that means first people looked in nature and they didn't see straight lines. But then they began looking in nature a bit more closer. And you see, for example, that light of the sun entering from the veg of the door was a straight line. Do you know? And that the sunbeam was like a straight line in nature. <clears throat> the subtle vision of the sunbeam. Do you know? And so, really, <clears throat> it's like, uh, um, think of it this way. Um, it, the Big Bang occurred, and there was cosmic inflation, and that cosmic inflation was an emergence of new properties in, 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 in a field. This field is kind of like, imagine the neurons in your brain, they suddenly became conscious, developed their own civilization, and when they came to philosophize about what they were, they didn't believe that they were being the neurons of you, you know? And so I thought something very fascinating, guys, that thought is what a person feels uh, a creative uh, vibe over. Do you know what I mean? It's like the new, there is energizes us. And I've often thought about this. What is the vision of health? What is the greatest health? What is, is it just the health of the body or is the mind required to be changed or shifted? So guys, just hold on. There's, um, I gotta change the angle of this table because the sun is hitting my face. Hold on.
Okay. I guess I should um, somehow direct the talk towards geometry, more towards geometry. Um, this whole thing about just, uh, I'm pretty much suggesting, suggesting that there's the same way we look at life in one moment and we can perceive it as like that's a tree, that's a bird, that's grass, that's that's like a chair. Like as we as we have like access to a sort of common reality, a common state of mind, I feel we also have access to uncommon states of mind. And that uncommon state of mind to Mr. Within has appeared as a sort of geometrical dimension, pure geometry. I call it poetically living geometry, Ge geometrical movement that is moving at speeds beyond the free will. So the person, it appears to it as if their imagination has a life of their own if they don't, if they just watch it. You see, it's that's the whole thing of life, that believe it or not, I am telling you, when I look at back at who I, how I see myself as a being, I see it as wind. The element of wind, the element of air, the element of this invisible force just moving through, do you know? <clears throat> and when I say invisible, because what is aware of the visible appears invisible to itself. It is, it is how the Upanishad said, the seer of the seen is unseen. That means the one the attention, so your attention to how you are paying attention is attributeless. That's another way of saying that. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that's the whole Patanjali Yoga Sutra class or idea. Now, in regards to geometry, in my inner realms, I have managed to share the geometry of my inner realms on paper. So I'm going to show you that. So this is something I drew in 2015, and let me tell you what the geometry of it was. It was as if, when you look at the empty piece of paper, it is just space. And any dis at first, decisions are made without order. That means in anything you try out at first, the first couple experiences will appear chaotic. Do you know? And once you endure through that chaotic beginning period, you then go find suddenly a simple access to the skill. You know? And it's like, imagine like you had to be a warrior back in the day and you pick up the sword and you've never held a sword before. You know? And so you pick up the sword and you realize this sword is the most important thing because back in the day, your survival depended on how well you use the tool you could find. So when you find a purpose for the tool, you use it confidently. When the tool is in your hand and you're not sure what to do with it, then in some sense, how can you use it? When your grip is not even firm. So, so it was a sense of perceiving space and then dimensions of layers of design add as complexity. Now, you can see the way I draw this geometric shape as if I just started from one corner and drawing, or you can see it that I, draw, I drew different parts of it in different ways in different times. Do you see? And really the essence of kind of, I would say, the style is, is kind of like chaos and order, as Rumi says, are like the wings, the two wings of the bird. The two wings of the bird that in some sense uh, the bird needs both wings to fly. Your mind as a character in a story requires dimensions of chaos and order to exist as a character. So your mind requires chaos in order to exist, just like a bird requires two wings to fly. Now, if you check it out, how weird would it be if the bird is just obsessed and just staring at its wings? A bird shouldn't be obsessed about its wings. When a bird flies, it doesn't look at its wings. It, it is content with both dimensions and it flies into the new. So when you become comfortable with the amount of chaos happening in your life, and when you become comfortable with the amount of order happening in your life, then you fly into new dimensions. But if you linger, if you linger on games of chaos and order, and especially through the prejudice of the inner realms, then it could be an endless, uh, you can say, you are, your thoughts are reincarnating. 
<laughs> your awareness as a thought is endlessly reincarnating in the moment because you a person that gets access to many thoughts you know how in Japan they say the man is the room he enters you know oh sorry the man is the room he's in right and so when you look at the, the human being or any person you have ever seen they have been who they have been in that room of mind in that neurochemical combination in that moment where you saw them so you see we are not just uh, dictionary definitions walking around so we can judge each other based on the precision of what we are or what our definitions are we are dynamic moving changing beings and hence the concept of growth renders the dictionary void because it's a suggestion that you are not just growing your whole world is the whole universe is choosing to stand in more sophisticated ways and that's kind of like uh, the a Lotus Sutra kind of conclusion where the Buddha realized everybody was enlightened from the beginning that means the light is in all of our eyes the existential authorization for experience is valid for many <clears throat> I feel we have to pilot our civilization into um, uh, a multi-dimensional maturity Is it worth doing something new? Is it worth seeing something new? And the ultimate question, is it worth being something new? Life is like a coin flip. Everything you try, there is a chance and potential that there can come turbulence. Pretty much when I look at my own activity, is that it's like I've just been this creature I've woken up and se series and sequences of actions has, has been done and then as the action is done there is an effect of the action scene so the person is believing it or not sharpening the blade of their own intellect by observing their own experience It's as if looking in the mirror and wondering how your eyes have helped the world. Not just your hands. The mind has a reach that surpasses the body. And the mind is an unknown territory of study. That means when I see the word imagination, when I see the word soul, tr believe it or not, all these mean the unknown to me. <laughs> so anybody could come and say like a story hey man behind this this world of ours we're actually this and that and this and that and this has happened and that has happened I'll be like great <laughs> you know there's a reason in the Upanishads they said neti neti not this not this there's a reason why in Zen they said kill the Buddha in Zen not in Buddhism in Zen in Zen they said kill the Buddha because the disciple would go meditate and suddenly an image would appear and they would feel their they are they would see in their subjective realms Buddha's glory and they would think they were Buddha in a past life right so Zen, you can totally say the mystics the Zen all those gentle living human beings on this planet that people thought were just monks sitting around they weren't just monks they were keeping a certain state of mind resonance alive on this plane during a period of history. Terence McKenna says nobody knows enough to worry. That means nobody knows enough to do anything, really. <laughs> so it's everything is on faith upon the unknown. I think that is the sign of an advanced uh, civilization, an advanced being, which leads to an adv advanced civilization. That it is no it, that it no longer is emotionally chained to certain subjects. The being becomes the witness of the world, the witness of the moment, and that's the uh, advanced communicator. That's how I use the word. 
where the human being has recognized an inseparability in how their own communication is simultaneously the communication and natural expression of the universal sector. That means if, if a person wants to, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, so they tell someone, why did you do this? And the person's like, you got to blame my ancestors. And then you go to blame the ancestors and that you ask them if those ancestors were here, they'd be like, you got to blame our ancestors. And eventually you're blaming bacteria that evolved from at the bottom of a sea for why you are in a certain <laughs> Geometry is the next great language of all languages. It is uh, a technology, I would say, that we can navigate our subjective realms and our attention as the moment of being, can its temperature can change, right? So imagine a person closes their eyes and they experience literally like, uh, a coming soon kind of movie preview uh, you see at the beginning of movie theaters imagine you close your eyes you're just sitting in a park and you experience that in your inner realms life moves itself and as it moves itself, it permits you to move yourself in certain times. And ultimately, knowledge is not finding a, a kind of sentence algorithm. It is in some sense, I find uh, a return to how the unknown is alive. Yeah, that's a perfect way of saying it. So I feel that it, our imagination right now is kind of hovering our subtler planes appear to us as an oscillation between reality, which is known, and imagination, which is unknown, right? Like suddenly the person has a strange dream or something, right? So, so like that means familiar moment, familiar moment, suddenly unfamiliar moment, suddenly then familiar moment, familiar moment, and then, oh my God, unfamiliar moment, you know? Every time I've been conscious in a dream state, I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> you know, it's like unfamiliarity. You know, it's the new. And when you don't fear the new, you f see the evolution of your own soul. And there's no greater teacher. That's it. That evolution of the soul is how your attention is through your just the nature of your breathing being, uh, interlinking all the ideas you have ever had with the moment as a sensory phenomenon. So it's starting off an objective realm, then there came an objective self, and there was an objective world, then an objective self came. Then we say, this objective self, this is what I'm saying, that there was a subjective evolution. They're not teaching this in schools. There's a subjective evolution that this objective self reached a point or something happened that it became a subjective self inside an objective self. And I think the way it happened was it looked at the world and saw the unknown. When the creature saw the unknown, that was the mirror of the mind. That was pretty much like the ignition of the subjective evolution. When limitation was crossed, So this objective world that led to an objective self, that self found a separation. It literally looked in the mirror and it's like, whoa, is that me? <laughs> Suddenly it became a subject to itself. Now when it became a subject to itself, you can't have a self without the world first. So the subjective evolution's explanation is really that the objective self got access to a subjective world and the objective world through the subjective world got access 
uh, to a sort of subjective self. So the, the simple view that I'm a thought, you know, a person thinks a thought of themselves and they're like, oh man, I'm that thought I just think, I just thought. You know? <laughs> First of all, you're never a thought, but anyways, you're witnessing thoughts, but you're not the thought, you know? That's why you have many of them. <laughs> That's why language can never be our face, our true face. The wings of the bird are open for a reason. This existence is occurring because intelligence is flying somewhere. That means it's like the purpose like the human being is like, why have I why have I been employed by manifestation? <laughs> by existential manifestation to be a creature that exerts force and work. You know? And then you suddenly kind of realize that it's like the world is working and that we're standing on the shoulder of giants thinking that we got it rough. I feel the educational system uh, should crystallize. Everything can crystallize, guys. Everything can become uh, more complex as simplicity is confronted. That means, think about it this way. If you haven't confronted your simplest self, if you haven't as a human being found comfort with being present in a simple way, you're going to fear failure till the end of your life. Because failure means a revert or denial of greater complexity. That's what failure means. Failure means the person, the, the, why is the person, why does the person want a success? Why are there so many success motivation videos on YouTube with millions and millions of views? Because human beings are realizing, you know, to some degree that there is an effort being exerted regardless. That means whether you like it or not, because you are a living being, because you're a human being, you have to engage, for example, the biological program. That means even for those beings who are living just as minds here, I'm telling you that is not enough. But the mind is important to be aware of for the body to move uh, divinely. And I've experienced that in certain moments where I suddenly went into an ecstatic dance. Like I don't consider myself a dancer at all. But there has been certain moments where it was as if my soul was hearing a song. There was a sort of inner melody, and I just went into this random, like, uh, kind of <laughs> ecstatic dance, you know? And if somebody was would ask me in that moment, why are you dancing? I would have no explanation. I'm like, it's energy, bro. I don't know. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I don't know, like the, the world is too mysterious to look down on it or look up to it too much. Really, it's about piloting it. Now, when we pilot it, I'm saying that at some point in our inner realms, we will come across imagination as living geometry, and the human being will wonder, what do I do with this? What do I do with uh, moving geometrical shapes in my unconscious? And let me tell you, your unconscious mind, I would like to say that see it like as if it's an ocean and see your conscious mind as a ship that you built with your own hands. Your conscious mind is self-defined. That means you are defining yourself in accordance to your experience. <clears throat> that means if a child, if like you look at Tarzan, you know, <laughs> Tarzan, <clears throat> if people don't know who that is, it's uh, pretty much this kid that grew up with gorillas, you know. <laughs> you know, so pretty much a kid where his moral support were, you know, gorillas. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyways, in, uh, what I'm saying is that creature, um, uh, that human being, Tarzan, he in some sense couldn't, couldn't... Uh, it's like he didn't need language. He would still have access to the language of experience. 
That means regardless of what someone tells you, because you're a living, actual being, because you actually are something that's here, that thingness of you is your own eyes. Every person's eyes is like a candle, okay? It's not a candle, like consciousness is like a flame. It's an illumination. When you open your eyes in the morning or your senses awaken in the morning, that what's really happening is like the world is being illuminated, as if the light in the room is being turned on, right? And when we go towards the unconscious, that's when the light in the room is turned off. And so death is when the ship sinks, okay? But inner death is when the person realizes the ocean and the ship, you know? <clears throat> realizes the magnitude of change, realizes there are forces that even the greatest billionaires can do nothing about. It's just nature. What are you going to do? You know, it's like, you know, no, no billionaire can talk back to gravity. What can be said? What can be said about an endless sky? What can be said about a mind that has no edge? What can be said about earth that just is matter in space? What can be said? And that's the grand realization. Not that history is his story or is a joke. It's just that the world is attempting something. The living universe is attempting something. And you are a part of that intelligence. You are part of the grand movement of nature towards sophistication. That evolution was a transformation of an object to a subject to itself. Can you imagine that? That means uh, Darwin didn't realize his uh, he ev evolution was the uh, was the most metaphysical explanation. <clears throat> that means it is as if saying the physical has a direction. It's gone. An unknown direction, let's go. You know, there's, um, I often say this in these talks, there's a scene from Lord of the Rings, the third movie, where Theoden King, this king, has in some sense, uh, they, they've kind of, like, there was a war at this mountain kingdom. What was it called? Gondor? <laughs> Man, I gotta watch the Lord of the Rings movies again. But pretty much there's the scene where Theoden King and his army come to defend the last stronghold of humanity. They come to defend their neighbor. And they defeat the army of that like messed up face kind of orc. <laughs> and that uh, they defeat the first army and they're all celebrating. And then they suddenly look to their left and they see giant mammoths coming. And you can see in Theoden King's face a king, the face of a king. In his mind, he's like, oh shit. <laughs> but he then instantly, after that oh shit moment, you know, oh my God moment. It was suddenly the, the horns of Rohan were heard and then they marched back into the battlefield. And that's what I see kind of the evolution of knowledge for the species to be, that it's the unknown. We're constantly meeting the unknown again and it's the task of the human being. That's why you're given inner realms. Your inner realms are like gifts given from the gods to you to handle the moment. They are, they are your hidden uh, weapon. You know, they say the mind is a weapon. I, 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 can, you, I, I mean, sure, you can see it as a shield too. You know, a shield is considered a weapon, but, you know, a defensive weapon. You know? I mean, you can probably slam someone with a shield. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, you know, some things can be used for intensity, intense purposes, or you can also bask in the pure lands of the gentle. I am telling you it's more rewarding being a gentle creature. You get more access to your inner realms. The more violent you are, the more you're waiting for uh, the, uh, the, thumb, the thumb of the Punisher to squash you. Do you know? That means uh, it's kind of like 
if you live indecently to in regards to in your own eyes that means let's say you're every person is acting throughout the day right now imagine you act in a way where if you were standing like in a th third person view looking at yourself in that moment you would be ashamed of how you act acted right so in those moments sometimes certain so there are these psych psychological side byproducts that what happens the person when they feel they wrong a moment they feel they don't deserve to be in a moment that means when you hurt those you love you feel you can't be around them so you leave and that's why you see so many fathers that uh, in certain cultures that they can't even be with their kids because they feel they have hurt the kid too much and that's not a good idea you know that's why we should realize every moment can be established in you that's something I, I understood I believe it or not into I had this sales job and it was I, it was like for donations but they were teaching sales techniques so I couldn't morally decide what it was <laughs> but I needed a job at the time and it was a job where door-to-door -door job for Red Cross where I would have to go in some sense knock on pr pretty much what was it like 400 500 doors a day and be like hello have you heard of Red Cross yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> believe it or not they told us you got to go to the door and say <laughs> you got to go to the door and say hey I'm not a gas company because people hate gas companies you know like <laughs> those door-to-door -door sales people this like donation is a different context you know <clears throat> same activity but in a different context anyways I had in that in that time there were certain people who were my seniors and I was just this new guy in, in the system you know and so I remember I learned so much from those people I learned so much of how far communication can go and I realized on some level this it, it's kind of like a reality projecting machine this life when you realize that you can't you'll realize like there is a space of freedom prior to any sort of judgment your mind has fathomed. And so in, 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 in like when I was around those people, I, I didn't attain the skill then. The skill that they sometimes your eyes see a skill. Sometimes in my youth I saw people do things I couldn't and then years later I could definitely do it. Do you know? It was like an example of one of them was whistling. You know, for example, my, when I was young, my father would whistle and then I was like, okay, I have no idea how to do this, you know, and so I had to master whistling, you know, and what it is, is you try something until you find some level of comfort or acquaintance with it, familiarity with it, because in familiarity, the mind automatically trusts, so skill bursts out, so any moment you trust can be said to have creative rhythmic momentum. <clears throat> I have uh, moved my attention in the moment through subjective geometry and what that means is the I was kind of walking on the street and then my mind it like literally like you know how you if somebody told you to visualize like a cube you would visualize like a cube but that cube is only in the room of your imagination like if somebody else was sitting there they couldn't see your visualization <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me.
geometry is a blessing of vision. And I feel we should incorporate in our cities greater geometry. I'm tired of just seeing squares and rectangles everywhere. You know, it's like we need we need more than gray uh, like gray streets. You know, there was a time in Italy there was a Medici family, and of course they were bankers, and their overall motives could have been questionable. But they did something smart for society. <clears throat> and what they did for society is was that they made it beautiful. They made it beautiful. And they had this vision that if we make society great, the people in the system have a greater percentage of greater chance of being great. You know? So right now society is not it's not a nice place. When you walk in the downtown of every country, what do you see? You see that the bro the defeated and the the successful and the defeated are walking in the same streets. You see people who their inner realms have descended to savage animalhood. You see people who, in some sense, have stopped even caring for uh, emotions. Do you know? <clears throat> that means something savage about um, life when it's not assisted is that it, be, it descends into its animal nature. And when it descends to its animal nature, it's like you can't wake up the person wake up that you it's like some people after they descend and they get emotionally bashed by the world that means life pushes them in, in states of mind where emotionally they break so they can't even hold the archetype anymore it's like imagine you wanted to grab a cup of coffee and like <clears throat> suddenly out of nowhere a Shaolin monk with a sword broke that cup of coffee and said no you can't you know, so in that moment, you'd be like, all right, maybe I'll drink coffee somewhere else. <laughs> you know, but it would leave an impression in your mind that to hold a cup of coffee feels dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think existing uh, humans, the, the human consciousness and civilization is very multidimensional and should be conducted multidimensionally and there should be a separation between the subjective realms and the outer realms, the inner realms and the outer realms. That means imagine somebody is angry, instead of everybody suddenly changing their opinion on that person, they just realize that person is caught in their inner realms for a moment. And you got to let the being calm down. Where like you can say the human being uh, is something, it's like a engine that you can't overwork it too much, you know, overload it. When you emotionally, after it goes past a certain emotional deterioration of identity, then the being becomes uh, uh, non-existential to themselves. And you know what that means? That means they have they they have life has occurred to them in a way where they feel they don't deserve to exist, even though they're existing. You know that that can appear. I mean, the, the whole st depression stress statistics is a suggestion that pretty much people are going home, they're bored, and in their boredom they're looking at their life, and the mind has an endless potential to see something be broken. Do you know? There have been times. You know, there's this story of these grandkids who pull up prank on their grandfather and they go get this like smelly cheese from the fridge and a tiny piece of it and they put it under the mustache of the grandfather when the grandfather is sleeping you know in the way in a way where the cheese won't fall right and the kids suddenly the grandpa wakes up and the kids are acting so disciplined and the grandpa's like okay these kids are too nice right now <laughs> so the grandpa suddenly smells and the smell hits him and he's like oh my god it smells terrible here he runs out of the room to get, escape the smell Check this out. He runs out of the room to escape the smell. He goes into like the bedroom. He's like, oh my God, it smells in here. He goes somewhere else. He goes, he, every room he goes to pretty much smells. And then he goes to the kitchen. And he's like, even here. Oh my God. And then he goes outside. He opens the door and he's like, oh no, the world stinks. <laughs> so from one tiny issue, uh, one tiny piece of cheese under the nose of the person, the person made the whole world feel as if it stinks. But the problem was inner. It was an inner problem that the person was trying to find an outer solution to 
but at the end realize you couldn't unless you c confront the inner problem. That means uh, you got to learn to live as a uh, live as a human being with yourself, regardless of whatever uh, your whatever depth your subjective realms push you. You know, there think of physical reality as the common language. You know, that means we all need to be able to speak the language of material existence. So that means no metaphysical idea should reduce the importance of objective efficiency and survival. This is a very crucial point because we got to preserve as much of our nature as we can. And because it's, it's kind of like a privilege, right? It's as if like, imagine... Um, you were hungry and they gave you the best part of a meal and you, you're holding the plate where the best part of the meal is in and then you drop the plate. How meaningless would that be? <laughs> How meaningless would it be if you don't care for something that has taken four billion years to become this advanced, you know? <clears throat> you know, guys, I'm going to... Um, probably end off here but I'll say this geometry is a uh, uh, is a diff is a is a dimension is the body of our imagination which we can control is a body for our imagination that we can control and living geometry means that the attention is not limited to just the movement that means if your conscious identity your personality or egoic construct is identifying with a certain wave uh, w certain range your attention is wavering or flickering like a candle when that attention moves when the spotlight turns the conscious identity is something else so I want, I think it's much more healthier to see life as a process than as like uh, 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 stick figures that we can storify, you know? There is an intelligence that is just in, in nature. It's like the way a squirrel runs over a fence is like there's a spiral-like nature to it. It's as if when you look at a squirrel and the movement of even the tail of the squirrel it, when it runs, it is, it's like, isn't it cool, guys? Squirrels are like a vertical view of a sine wave. Snakes are like a horizontal view of a sine wave. You know, it's like so many, th so much of nature is just moving in itself. It's moving as itself. And really, human consciousness is the, is the separation from nature. <clears throat> that means man is really asking, is there a reason to leaving uh, the uni unified field? And the answer is, yeah, but you got to create it. <laughs> you know, the creative vision now more than ever is needed towards... Uh, you know, advancement towards civilization 2.0. You know? Anyways, thanks for listening, guys. Much blessings and namaste.